But yeah, so I, I ended up moving out uh, from living with that girl, and I, I shortly thereafter was living with a good friend of mine that I had been in Teen Challenge with. He and I were good influences on each other. Uh, if we relapsed, uh, we did it separately. We never did it together. And so that was always still a fruitful relationship because we never wanted to drag each other into our failures. Uh, and and even even though we were roommates, we we kind of helped hold each other's head above the water. It was it was pretty neat because we both had the same struggles. We both knew that, and we both knew when each other was falling, and we just stayed out of it uh, when the other one was struggling like that because we knew that we would fall with them too. And uh, we're still really good friends today. And we we talk about this stuff sometimes. But um, that was a good time in my life for a little while. And then, uh, you know, like any other good time in your life, uh, it came to an end. 
I uh, I started relapsing again really bad, pretty regularly. Uh, I had a really good job. Um, I say a pretty good job. <laughs> uh, and I was, I had kind of worked my way up a little bit at the place I was at. And uh, I, I want to say I was pretty happy, I guess. But I was, I was relapsing probably once every two to three months for a little while, you know. And uh, I still hadn't completely abandoned the idea that I could still hang out with my old friends and still be clean. And I, I just hadn't given that up yet. I hadn't given up a lot of things. I was always drinking. And I think I was still smoking at this time too, smoking cigarettes, smoking pot and stuff. But um, I um, I ended up failing a drug test at my job. There's a lot of things that happened in between uh, some of these events, but uh, one of the biggest milestones uh, that I'll just go ahead and skip to is that I failed a drug test at that job. And I had always been one of the best at every job I worked. I was, I would, you know, I, I'd use work as an addiction just like anything else. You know, I get stuck on trying to be the best at my job. And if you've worked with me, uh, you probably don't recognize that because <laughs> I was struggling with all my addiction and stuff at the same time. So I thought I was great, but I, I probably wasn't that great. <laughs> But uh, I, I I failed this drug test, and, and the policy at this job was that you had to go to a six or eight week uh, outpatient drug rehab program, and you had to complete it uh, before you could come back to work. And my pride wouldn't let me just quit that job and go work somewhere else. I had to come back and somehow sort of make that right. So. I wasn't, they, I failed my drug test for smoking pot, and I wasn't honest with anybody, um, even, even through the outpatient rehab program, I wasn't honest with anybody that I had actually been uh, doing pills again, and that I was uh, really deep into it, uh, probably the most addicted that I had ever been to the point that even my old friends knew I didn't, I didn't value their relationship anymore. And I didn't care about hanging out with them. That the only reason I was coming around was because I wanted to get high and, uh, and then, and then I was going to be gone. And so it, it was a weird time because I had been clean at different times and kind of grew up a little bit and you know I'm going back and I'm hanging out with some of these friends that had not grown up they had stayed in it and I thought I was better than them uh, I was really prideful and what I looking back now I'm like how in the world <laughs> I was doing the same thing they were I was living the same life but uh, yeah, I just I had to um, I had to go to this program, and uh, it's an outpatient program here in Cookville. Uh, was probably the most beneficial tool that I was ever involved in as far as getting clean. And I think a lot of that was because in order to graduate, you had to go to twelve step meetings, whether it was. Uh, AA or NA, um, you had to go, and before you could graduate, you had to actually have a sponsor at one of those two organizations. You had to be talking to somebody like every day. Um, so you had the group therapy at the this organization, and then you had the AA or NA meetings you were going to, and and then you had your sponsor that you call every day, and. Uh, it was a lot. I ended up, uh, I 
quit drinking for the first time. Man, there was there was never really a lengthy amount of time that I had ever quit drinking. Um, so I, while I was in this program, I quit. Um, I quit smoking. I quit everything, um, and I started listening to sermons <laughs> on on a MP3 player that my mom had given me, uh, and and specifically listening to these. Uh, it's called heart physics. Uh, there were these meditation. Um, clips of of just uh, positive affirmations. You know, you're the righteousness of God, uh, and 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 just all kinds of really positive uh, affirmations. And you're just meditating in that stuff. And 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 I started doing that stuff pretty regularly. And I thought it was really kooky at first. I thought it was really weird. Uh, but I started doing that, and I I felt like God was telling me I was ready to get married. I was like, uh, I'm in rehab, you know, <laughs> and and anybody that's new to AA or NA or new to sobriety at all, uh, you know, one of the number one rules is you don't get in a relationship anytime soon. And so I was, I, I kind of reacted pretty negatively um, to that idea of getting married, but I was like, okay, you know, if that's, if that's what you want, God, but I don't think I'm ready. And uh, I was talking to somebody, a really good friend of mine, uh, pretty regularly, and and she was she was going to school at Lee University or Christian College, and uh, she was just a really good positive influence on me during that time. And she we were having these phone conversations of just sharing the truths that God was revealing to us at that time in our life and, and just being completely open about what God's truths are and what the positive things that we knew that he had for us. Um, and I really, honestly, I kind of thought I might end up marrying this girl. Uh, and, and then a little while later, um, I decided to go to church with my sister, and that this was all while I was still off of work um, going to this outpatient rehab program. So in a very short period of time, it's like it's like God helped me skip through some levels of, of sobriety, uh, and it, it was amazing. I, I had never experienced sobriety where I wasn't holding on to something and really the only things I wasn't holding on to were the drugs uh, the pills and stuff the, the the reality of it was I had every intention and I didn't really know it at the time but I hadn't let go of alcohol I had already decided in in here that that was something I was still going to participate in later uh, and, and and that ended up hurting me later, but uh, I didn't even see that until recently, that that was kind of something I was still holding on to. But uh, I ended up going to church with my sister and meeting my wife, and it was like, that from the day that my wife and I met, we didn't, we didn't do anything but hang out. I mean, it was like we were together every day. Um, she was definitely the one from, from the minute I met her, I knew that I was going to marry her. And, uh, we, we got married a very short amount of time later. Um, and we, I think it was four or five months after we met, uh, maybe Maybe six. <laughs> She'd be mad at me if she knew that I wasn't sure about that. But uh, we um, we got married, and uh, I, somehow in that time frame, from graduating from that program to meeting my wife to getting married, I st- 
started thinking that it was okay for me to start drinking again. And uh, that, yeah, you know, I, I got this. I can handle, you know, drinking a little bit. And for a while, it was fine. Um, but it was a messed up thing to try to bring into my marriage relationship. You know, my wife, I had told her about my past. She knew that I had been on drugs. She knew that I had had issues with alcohol. She knew a lot of things. Um, and now I look back and I don't know, I don't know how the wife that I married then, it can be the same wife that I'm married to now because anyone that could live with me back then would not be able to stand me now and vice versa. It's like, I don't know how she's hung with me through all that, but I, I started drinking again and I started drinking heavily. Uh, because I wasn't, I was I wasn't gonna do any drugs and I wasn't uh, doing any pills and and so when when an addict gets on just alcohol and for whatever reason you have a conscience against your other past addictions, um, you you hit the bottle pretty hard and and I hit it really hard. I was I was drinking all the time. And around the time my wife got pregnant with our first son, which was shortly after we were married, maybe uh, three months, four months, um, we, I decided that I was going to quit drinking and start talking to my sponsor again uh, just while she was pregnant. And um, so I quit drinking and started making some good changes in my life. Uh, I had hung out with some of my old friends for a little while, uh, and I, I sort of cut that off for a little while again. Um, I, I, I just, even during that time, I wasn't letting go of it. I was still, I still had all the intentions of drinking later. And I look back at that, and I'm like, what's the point of quitting something if even when you quit it, you intend on doing it again later? It's like, it's like you're not, you're not giving God anything to work with there. You're, you're basically just saying, you know, I'm going to quit this because I think you're right right now, but I don't really trust you about the future, <laughs> you know? And so I, I, I didn't even know that I was holding on to that. But uh, I I started drinking again after our son was born, or or right before he was born, I think. And uh, and he's seven now. Um, so for about six and a half years, uh, and we had an, another son in there. Uh, I I've drank and uh, thought it was okay. Thought it was fine. And it's like I said earlier, when you start doing something like that, you never have the intention of doing it forever. But once you're married and you have kids, the time goes by really fast. And, you know, before I knew it, it had been four years or, let's see, three years, and I was drinking heavily. Uh, I was still sort of okay with porn. I, I really, I didn't know what it was doing to me. But every once in a while, you know, I'd go back to that too. And uh, it, it messed with my conscience. It made me to where, you know, I wasn't actively, I would never have, I would never have sought out a situation to be unfaithful to my wife. Um, but in the case about, it was about two or three years after our son was born, our first son, uh, I, that situation literally came to my doorstep and I didn't have the conscience 
or the will. Um, I just didn't have the heart to fight it because I was letting all these other things cloud my vision. I was relapsing. I was doing pills again um, a little bit. I was hanging out with my old friends a little bit. I was doing a little bit of everything, and I was drinking a lot. And I had no idea what it was doing to me. Uh, Because from the outside, my life probably looked pretty good. Um, My my wife, she, she sort of knew that I had been unfaithful. She sort of accused me a little bit. She talked to me, confronted me a little bit about it. And I sort of brushed it off. Um, It scared me enough to make me quit hanging out with my old friends. It scared me enough to um, get away from the situation that I was being unfaithful in. Uh, and it scared me enough to quit doing any kind of drugs. Um, but I wasn't free. I I had been caught, and that was the only reason that all those things stopped. And we went on for another four years another three and a half years um, before I was really convicted about the rest of those things and I was really convicted about being honest about that situation in my marriage and I was smoking pot pretty much all the time I was drinking all the time like always and uh, I had two boys. Now we have three. Um, Our third was just born uh, about a week and a half ago. But I had two boys and I was I was doing good. I have a good job. Everything's pretty good in life. But I wasn't really living. Um, There's a whole aspect to life that we miss out on, that we can, we can be doing pretty good. I feel like there's a lot of people who are believers and even non-believers who can relate to living life. It's like you're coasting. It's like you're a zombie. It's like you're in default mode. Um, you, you kick into these like core values. And for me, it was, you know, like God, beer and guns, you know, like that kind of mentality that like good, you know, as long as I have my good like country boy type values or as long as I have my, um, you know, my core values that you, I'm just operating out of and they serve me pretty well for somebody who wants to live just a bored, boring, dull life. And, um, man, like six months, seven months ago, um, actually I should go, I should go back to March of 2020. Um, my, my wife's aunt and uncle, um, were murdered in their home. And they were really awesome people that we were very close to in March of 2020. And I've always had a hard time talking about that because it's not it's not my situation because it's not my immediate family. Um, and I've always just had a difficult time even speaking towards that because that's her aunt and uncle. Um, that's someone else's parents. That's her father's sister, and I just had a heart for everyone in the family uh, throughout that whole thing, and uh, it really, really messed with the family. 
pretty good. It hurt everybody a lot. Uh, they were shot in their home uh, by some guy on drugs, you know. Could have been me. But uh, my wife and I, because COVID was hitting at the time pretty bad, we left my boys with our parents here in Cookville, and we went to her parents' house, which is uh, kind of the Knoxville area. <clears throat> we stayed with them for a couple of weeks uh, through all that. I drove them and my wife to the house uh, the day after, I believe it's, yeah, it's the day after it had happened. Uh, and we, we looked at the house, we looked at the damage and the things that had happened there were very evident. Uh, you could you could pretty much put the whole story together by just looking around. Um, and uh, so we, we went, through that with them uh, and then that night I was praying for them and uh, you know most of the time when we pray especially especially then when I would pray um, when we're just believing and we're not following our prayers are more selfish uh, they're very self-centered um, sometimes even when we think they're not, they still are. And, uh, and it's always still a good idea to talk to God because, you know, it says in Romans that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and, and, and says, it tells God things that we can't even get out, but we have Christ in us. If you're a believer you have Christ in you. You have the Holy Spirit interceding for you. It's important to talk to God. So I was praying for everyone in my family, and I think it was the first time that I was ever really unselfishly saying a prayer to God because I just wanted God to comfort that family. It's crazy how it takes it. A huge loss like that for you to finally not be a selfish person but somehow uh, I feel like something really good came from that uh, the next morning we were supposed to drive to the viewing and I was going to take them all my wife and my mother and father-in-law to the viewing and uh, we we were about to leave, and I think I was getting ready to go, taking a shower or something, and I felt like God told me I needed to pray with them out loud in front of other people, which was not something that I did. And I was like, God, I don't, I don't know if that's you or me or what's going on. And, and I just, he just started giving me the words to say to start praying. And I was like, okay, you know. If, I, if you give me some words, then then maybe I can do this, you know. So we were starting to leave, and I wasn't a spiritual leader uh, in any sense in my home uh, or anything like that. So even praying in front of my wife uh, very seriously wasn't anything I don't think I had done, I mean, other than, you know, thanking God for the food. <laughs> it was like about maybe all she had ever heard me do. And that wasn't even when we were at home. That was just, you know, if somebody asked me to at Thanksgiving or something. <laughs> so I I said this prayer. Uh, it was it was an important day uh, for my wife's family because it was also um, my wife's late grandfather's birthday. And he had just passed away that year. So it was a it was a pretty emotional day, um, but God, God had some words for my mother and father-in-law and for my wife to comfort them, and He was going to use whoever was there, and I was there, and I was obedient. 
uh, for maybe what now I look back might have just been like the second time in my whole life that I was really obedient to God. And man, the God's reward for obedience, we think of like a reward as being something very, you know, that what, what would what we would want. God's reward for obedience is himself. And when you've experienced that reward, you realize there's nothing else worth living for. That reward is what it's all about. And I said this prayer. It was pretty cool. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like a little emotional thing. And uh, and then we went to the viewing, and I said a prayer there with the family too. And and uh, and and then we came back, and I was like, well, that was neat, you know. But a couple of nights later, or maybe that that night. Um, I was coming in from being out on the balcony at my in-laws house and I was upstairs in their house and all at once, I don't even, I don't even think I was praying. I don't even think, I don't even know if I was thinking about God, <laughs> but it was, it was like he, his his presence was so heavy that I couldn't hardly get up. I, could, I, I went down on my face on, on the barrier rug that was on the floor. And, uh, and I just was thanking God for whatever that was. <laughs> and it went on, you know, I had had some kind of minor experiences like that in, in my past, but this lasted a while and it felt like if you've ever experienced God's presence it feels like it feels like a magnification of all the love you've ever felt from anybody in your whole life it's like it's like think of the purest relationship you've ever had with a person and the love that you felt from that and then multiply it infinitely and uh you know i just felt like i didn't deserve it uh felt a lot of things but mostly i just wanted i i, I remember asking god to just hold that just keep that around for a minute and and he did and i said a prayer for everybody in my family everyone in my immediate family everybody I mean, I just went through the list. I was like, man, I felt like, I felt like, you know, sometimes when you pray, you feel like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. But right then, I felt like God was right there in front of me. And it was, it was the most amazing thing I've ever experienced. Set me free 